Good morning. The boss is the boss just left us. Yes. My name is uh, Jok Walraven. I would like to welcome you on behalf of the organizers of the school. We the crowd of three people that applied two years ago for the school. Two years ago, we had a similar school on the topic, light and cold atoms, which is a very active field with many young people. And one of the aspects of the field is that uh, we organize schools. And when we found out, and these schools often are given in Europe, but we found it out that, it, that it's possible to organize such a school also in, in South America. And that's why uh, we, we feel very positive about it and support this school. You see, there's two organizers from Brazil, and I am from the Netherlands. You've seen the list of lecturers. These are excellent lecturers, people that are very active in their field. And, uh, um, and, uh, and so it, it's a great opportunity for you to interact with them. And we would like to promote as much as possible an active attitude. But there may be differences in the students. Who of you is an experimentalist? Yes. And who is a theoretician? It's about 50-50. Actually, that's what we find if we talk cold atoms interaction with light. It's usually 50-50 experiment and theory. That's not in every field. Our field is very rich because of this. It means that you can learn from your uh, co-students and meet students that will grow older with you in parallel. And uh, at school like this, you can make friends for life and scientific colleagues for life. Who of you are, are from Brazil? Yes, that's the majority. Who is, from, who is from South America, not Brazil? That's a nice crowd. Who is from outside South America? That's the European guy. We organize a special exam for those who are not from South America. OK. Unfortunately, one of our distinguished speakers, Professor Davidovic, you know he has a very important role in, uh, as the president of the academy in, in Brazil. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it. But he promised us a very strong colleague to deliver his lecture. So you've also seen the program. Inside the program, well, let me see. You see here posters, posters. That's an opportunity to present your work, and we really, um, we really want you to active, be active. This is a school. This is not a. Um, um, a workshop or something. No, it's a school. It's an opportunity to learn a lot. And you can do that by presenting your posters. There's work in groups. Yes, work in groups. Later on, we will explain what the work in groups mean. So I think this is, uh, this is what I wanted to say as, as, as the, at the start. Oh, this doesn't work, of course. So what's left is to wish you a fruitful school. And I would like to give the word to the first speaker, Philippe Courte. Uh, everybody understands me? Everybody is me? Okay. 
Yeah, uh, good morning. My, ne my name is uh, Philippe Courtey. I'm from San Carlos. Uh, uh, it's a part of it's a campus of the University of São Paulo uh, in uh, in São Carlos. And um, yeah, so my <clears throat> my role is to to give you uh, an introductory le uh, lecture uh, about this uh, field uh, that this, the whole school will all uh, will be all about. Um, and so I expect that uh, not everybody will be from the area of, uh, of cold atoms. Actually, who, who is from this area? Uh, uh, who is working experimentally or theoretically with cold atoms uh, in the auditorium? So it's a small minority. So um, actually, uh, the field of, uh, of cold atoms is not very, uh, very present in South America. Uh, so I think it's it's really good idea to have a, an introductory uh, lecture to uh, get you involved uh, a little bit with the basic concept of this lecture of, of this uh, of this uh, topic. It's uh, not a very old field of um, of physics. I mean, it's a quite a young field of physics, the interaction of of, uh, of light with atoms. Actually, the, what what this field is mostly uh, all about is the control of the atomic motion. It's not about the in, the internal uh, structure of the atoms, which is of course a very uh, older field of physics. But it's more about the about the control, uh, uh, or it's also very much about the control of the atomic motion. And this uh, field is called um, uh, also atom optics. Okay, and uh, so it's uh, like like what you what you do with um, with 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 light. Light is a wave, uh, 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 and we know uh, that matter has also wave-like properties. So uh, applying similar concepts uh, that that are known for light. Uh, two atomic matter waves. This is the field of matter uh, of atom optics, and this field is, is now, in the last 30 years, has, has been uh, growing uh, very much due to, the, to due to invention to, of a very powerful experimental technique. So, what what made all this this uh, this, this uh, field come up is uh, experimental progress. Without it, this, uh, the experimental progress to make cold atoms in the first place, to trap the atoms and to un to analyze them, uh, this this field wouldn't simply exist. Okay. Okay, since um, uh, ex uh, the experiment techniques are very important for this field of phys physics, a uh, lot of my uh, introductory course will be about experimental techniques, telling you how to cool, uh, cool atoms, uh, how to trap them, and, and, uh, and what new features are coming uh, into play when you do this. And, what, uh, and, and then you have a, once, once this, this works, you have a, a uh, very powerful playground uh, where you can do real uh, nice atomic physics and quantum me mechanics at its, uh, at its best. Okay. Now about the organization of this lecture, um, there will be five lectures. Uh, so um, I will concentrate uh, the first uh, one, one or two lectures about um, this, um, describing a little bit the, um, the, 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 the quantum mechanical formalism uh, that we use in, uh, in order to describe the interaction of light with matter. Then uh, in lecture three and four, I will uh, focus more on the interaction of light with matter, with matter to exert forces on the atoms and uh, how these forces can be harnessed to, uh, for uh, cooling and trapping. And uh, the last lecture, I will um, uh, um, use this, this knowledge that we have acquired then to uh, talk about uh, synchronization effects, uh, collective effects in light matter interaction, um, which will be a little bit more, more specialized. Okay. Um, now about the organization, I, um, I prepared a script for this lecture, which can be downloaded. Um, So if you're interested in, uh, in uh, oops, sorry. in, in uh, looking at the script, you go to the web page of our, uh, this is my, my group in San Carlos. So the Instituto de Física de San Carlos, USP, the uh, I, and then Strontium. Like the mechanical element strontium, so tilde strontium. Um, and then you go um, to the menu, teaching. Okay, uh, and then there's here uh, this, this lecture here. You click here, and then you can download the, the, the lectures here. 
So the lectures actually are uh, excerpt from lectures that I give uh, in San Carlos, so various courses that I give in San Carlos. So it's a, it's a, a little booklet. In fact, uh, um, uh, many uh, large parts of these booklets are copied from, uh, from other textbooks, like a, a very good textbook is uh, uh, Metcalf and Van, Strat Van der Straten and uh, John Weiner and, and Ho, who, uh, who have uh, written books. So you may uh, as well uh, consult this. But you can also have a look here. So uh, if you go to this, uh, uh, this web page downloading this document, uh, the advantage here is that um, there are some simulations that I use to prepare some graphs. And if you click on the simulations, on the, on the captures, let's see if I find one just to give an example here. Uh, so if you click here, you can download the, the MATLAB. Uh, so I, I, do, I prepare all my all my my my, um, my graphics with MATLAB. You can download the MATLAB code. You can run it uh, on your computer and play a little bit around with the parameters. Just um, if you're interested in, in seeing how that works. No? Okay. So just click, uh, go to the picture, click on the on the on the captions, and you will uh, you will have this thing. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so I will uh, I will use the, the, as, as much as possible the blackboard, but sometimes if there are illustrations also I will uh, I will uh, use the, the, the script. Yeah? Okay, so um, our microscopic world, of course, is dominated by matter and light. So these are the two things uh, that exist. At least at the end of the 19th century, uh, the people thought that the only uh, thing that really exists is uh, atoms and light. So the, the notion of atom comes, uh, has a very long history. Né? So already Lois, Lois Kippos and Democrat, uh, 2,400 years uh, ago, uh, already uh, thought theoretically about, about this problem. And uh, actually, it's a citation from uh, Democrit who said, uh, there's nothing else than atoms and free space. And uh, nowadays, we know that he was not, uh, he was not, uh, not that wrong. No? I mean, it's actually pretty close to, to reality. What you have is atoms, and between the, the atoms and between uh, the, the, the particles making up an atom, you have a lot of space. Okay? And you need that, that space in order to, make this, this, the, 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 to, to allow for the dynamics to, to occur. Uh, of course, uh, the, the, the notion of the atoms, of the atomic structure has evolved uh, during the centuries. And there's a very complicated uh, uh, history back and forth uh, with, uh, with changing notions. Uh, but the end of, uh, at the end of the 19th century, uh, this was like that. Um, uh, you had atoms, so you have matter. Matter is constructed of atoms, uh, and atoms are massive particles. And then you have light. Light is a, light is a wave, okay? And, uh, and then uh, light can interact with atoms, of course. Now, we, we know that uh, since quantum mechanics, that, uh, this is not, uh, not as easy because light has also uh, particle features and uh, matter can, can also have wave-like features. So um, all this is a little bit uh, more intricate. Uh, and uh, nowadays, with, uh, with our uh, basic theories that, that are the, the fundamental theory of this field, uh, which are um, electrodynam electrodynamics and quantum mechanics, we think that we have a very good picture of what's, what's really happening. You know? So we have, but we have to accept this, this duality, duality principle. And basically, uh, we have to accept that atoms are also waves. And this is uh, what atom optics is all about. So at atom optics is uh, exploiting the wave nature uh, of particles in order to make uh, new effects where uh, matter is behaving like a wave. No? The best example is the condensate, the Bose-Einstein condensate, where, uh, where, the, where the whole con condensate is basically nothing else than uh, the Broglie wave, which is as large as the condensate itself. Okay, okay so um, now let me define uh, the, the field. So uh, the field Normally, in quantum mechanics, this is the way you proceed. You write down uh, the Hamiltonian, right? And the Hamiltonian, uh, in, the, in the most simplest case, uh, the simplest case means uh, you have only one atom, 
and uh, so you don't care about this, the interaction of this atom with other atoms. Uh, then you have to, to, to say what, is, uh, what uh, energies uh, are contributing to, to, uh, to, to your atoms. So you have, um, first of all, uh, if you consider the atom as a particle, as a, which has a mass, uh, so you have the center of mass Hamiltonian, which is, which is right with capital mass, a key. So this is a kinetic energy, and you can put this uh, this uh, particle also in a potential. Uh, then you have uh, uh, this Hamiltonian of um, of an atomic center of mass. Okay, but um, we know uh, now since Niels Bohr and uh, uh, at least that uh, atoms also have an internal structure. So you have also to write down uh, the Hamiltonian for the for the electron. So this is the center of mass. Now you have to write down the, the Hamiltonian for the electron. So uh, I've prepared here a graph here. So uh, the people working with strontium, they, they know this, uh, this uh, very well. This is a so-called Grotian uh, diagram of strontium, atomic strontium. This is a simplified diagram of the relevant uh, levels which play a role when you, when you play around with these with this atoms. Now, uh, in, in investigating the structure of these atoms, this is, uh, uh, this is the role of atomic physics. Yeah, this is uh, what, uh, what people do who are uh, trying to investigate the, the, the internal structure. So what, uh, what levels are there? What, what are the spin, spin configurations? What is, uh, uh, what is the, uh, the transition prob probability between different levels? Okay. But uh, in atom optics, we are not interested about this. We just need, need uh, use this as a as a feature or as a as a tool in order to manipulate uh, uh, the atomic motion. But we have to to know, of course, the, the level structure in order to play around uh, with, with with the atoms because uh, these degree of freedom they are in, they are angled somehow. No? So if you if you uh, uh, throw a photon uh, on, on, onto the atom, you will uh, you will excite maybe an internal level. But you may also, you may may also accelerate the atom via photonic recoil. So uh, this this interaction will uh, inf uh, inf have an impact on the internal structure and also on the external uh, on, on the external motion. So uh, since we are not in interested in the in the details of the internal structure, we just write uh, the Hamiltonian for the internal structure like this. Okay, so uh, h bar omega e is just the energy of all those levels. I runs over all all the different uh, possible electronic configurations, all the all the states that, that they exist. And uh, here, this uh, ket bra uh, i is just uh, in order to uh, is just a, pro a projector on this state. But uh, what this energy is, this are the atomic physicists who make spectroscopy uh, and, and do all, all kinds of uh, calculations and, and measurements who have to tell you what, uh, what this is. And not only where the, where, the, uh, where, the, um, where the levels are, okay, but also what is the transition probability? Or let's say if you have uh, excited uh, a certain level, how, how likely is it for the level to, to decay spontaneously? Okay, all this uh, needs to be uh, needs to be yeah, known before you do atom optics, uh, atom optics. So we we will accept this and not bother too much how how we got there, uh, and just consider uh, for the following and during during all my lecture and I think during the lecture for, for the lecture of all uh, uh, speakers of this course, we will uh, uh, con concentrate on this and uh, and not go beyond. Okay, but then you have uh, the light fields. I mean, uh, no, this, this lecture is about uh, the interaction of cold atoms and light, so we also need to write down the um, uh, Hamiltonian for the radiation field. Okay, and now uh, the radiation field can, can be in all directions of space. No? So we have uh, uh, this direc di direction of space we call modes. This modes, this is a K. No? This is uh, the wave number or the wave vector of a certain mode. And you have, uh, it's a continuous distribution. You know, the electromagnetic vac vacuum runs over all directions with all polarizations and with all frequencies. Okay? And um, so in, in second quantization, you write 
you write the, the energy of the electromagnetic field like this. So every mode uh, uh, is basically a harmonic oscillator, uh, um, which, which has a numbers of photons, uh, which make up the intensity. And these numbers of photons you, you write down by this uh, combination of annihilation and creation operator and second quantization. Okay? So this is basically the numbers of photons. This is the energy of the photons. And this uh, one half is the energy of the vacuum fluctuations. Okay? Because um, since all the photons have the same energy, you can consider them as a harmonic oscillator. Like uh, a harmonic, harmonic oscillator, also, all the, the energy spacing is, uh, is the same, is constant. So this is the same for photons because all the photons are the same. So we can identify a mode with a harmonic, harmonic oscillator. And of course, then you have a zero, zero, zero point fluctuations, which, uh, which we have to take into, into account. Now, uh, during most lectures, we will not uh, 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 talk too much about the quantization of the electromagnetic field. There will be, however, uh, exceptions. I think Michel Brun is doing cavity, cavity QED, so he will concentrate more on this part of the Hamiltonian. But uh, in most cases, or in many cases, not in all cases, but in many cases uh, in atom optics, uh, we, we have so many photons in the modes that one photon more or less doesn't matter. So if you have a laser, you have trillions of photons, and uh, one photon more or less doesn't matter, so you, so you don't need to quantize this degree of freedom, okay? And you consider it as classical. Okay, so these are uh, basically these are the, the different contributions that, in principle, you, you should care about if you investigate the interaction of light and uh, and atoms at the most fundamental level possible. I would say, because um, uh, if you uh, what what you really uh, have in, in physics or in nature, I mean, it's uh, all interactions are mediated by collision processes, right? Uh, for example, collisions of an atom with a photon. Okay. Then, uh, if the atom uh, was was uh, was initially in the ground state, okay, after uh, after an absorption, for example, it might be in the excited state. Or when the photon is uh, scattered back, the atom might be in the ground state, but the photon is going into another mode. Okay, so you can you can picture this as a as a collision process. In a collision process in quantum mechanics, you you typically uh, uh, um, uh, picture as a concatenation. Of the degrees of freedom of, uh, that are involved in this, uh, in this interaction process. And what are the, in the degrees of freedom that interact? Well, there is the center of mass of the atom, there is the electron, and then there is a light field. So you have three, three, at the most fundamental level, I would say, you have three degrees of freedom uh, which uh, may or not, may not be uh, necessary to be quantized. You know, this depends on your, on your physical situation. But uh, it's possible to, uh, to imagine situations. Where, where this uh, basic process, where all degrees of freedom need to be quantized. Okay, now what are the, what are, how to, how to, uh, how to um, write down uh, uh, formally this collision process? Well, um, uh, okay, I forgot to say, once you have, um, once you have uh, this uh, Hamiltonians, all, all, uh, um, all this, uh, this corresponds to energies, and of course the energy is conserved. Okay, uh, and during the collision process, all the, the, the energy needs to be conserved as well, no? uh, and not only only the energy, but also the momentum and the angular momentum needs to be conserved. Okay, so uh, uh, in the yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah, degenerate, degeneracy. Yes. Yeah. So this um, would. Yeah. Then you would have to, you would you would write this down for for every uh, level that you have degenerate or not, and uh, sometimes you would have. Uh, you would have uh, uh, equal omega i, and sometimes not. So here uh, you have to consider all all states. So um, uh, electronic states, spin states, uh, uh, fine structure, hyperfine structure, Zeeman splitting, everything, 
uh, every every single state has to uh, be uh, treated separately. And we will see how, how this is important, we'll see in the third lecture. But basically, yes, for the hydrogen atom, this is possible to calculate this exactly, no? but uh, this is the only atom where, where it's possible to calculate. All the item, other atoms already is not possible. And all the other atoms, there is no degeneracy anymore, except uh, Zeeman degeneracy if you have a, don't have magnetic fields. No? Okay, uh, now here, um, uh, what are the, uh, the physical quantities that, uh, that describe uh, uh, this collision process? Well, there's al always some entity which, much, which must uh, change. For example, uh, if you absorb a photon, there must be a photon annihilated, okay? So this, this you could, or, or if you have an uh, emission of a photon, a photon must be created. So for example, uh, this is a photon which is created. If a photon is created, then uh, normally, uh, uh, when the photon is created, it's uh, due to a de-excitation process, okay? So that means that uh, together with this uh, creation photon, you must have a de-excitation process of the atom, which I write down by the Pauli matrix for de-excitation. Basically, the, the Pauli matrix of, for de-excitation is nothing else than the than, uh, than transition from state two to state one, okay? Two, one. But, and this is now important, and this is essential for atom optics, this is not the only degree of freedom because we learned we have, uh, we have photons, we have uh, excitation, but we also have the, the center of mass motion. Okay? And now uh, this needs to, be, uh, to, to, uh, needs to be counted by another degree of freedom, and this degree of freedom is, you can write it like this, okay? and this is uh, uh, an operator which is called the, um, the acceleration operator. So it makes a, trans uh, it makes a, a transition from, uh, from a state, I write it like this. If the item has, um, has initially the momentum P, then uh, due to photonic recoil, uh, the atom goes to another uh, momentum, uh, velocity, velocity state, uh, which is displaced in momentum space by uh, the photonic recoil, which is h bar k. Okay? So in fact, this R is an operator. Yes, a quantum mechanical operator. Okay? And uh, it's possible to show, uh, it's formally, it's possible to show that, that, uh, that this, uh, uh, applying this operator to, um, to, a, to a state, to a momentum state, the momentum state is dislocated uh, in momentum space. Okay, um, you can you can uh, uh, read this in quantum mechanical textbooks or also in the script. Um, uh, at some, at some points in the script, because this is a short script, at some, at some points of the script there is a, there is a link to a more extended script uh, where where there are some some mechanical quantum mechanical calculations, for example, uh, showing that this is true. Now you have uh, concatenation of three degrees of freedom, and I would say this is a bit the most basic uh, thing that can happen. Uh, of course, there are many more things that can happen, but this is the most best basic thing that, that, that can happen. Uh, and uh, if an atom is hitting, uh, uh, a photon is hitting an atom, at least uh, uh, there, there will be an absorption, uh, there will be a, a transition, and there will be a photonic recoil. Yeah. And this here uh, is, uh, he, uh, you have the, 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 the change of, of the momentum is only h bar k. In h bar k, the, 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 the recoil of a single photon is very small. Okay? And that means that in order to be able to, uh, to, to have any, uh, any effect, that, uh, any detectable effect from this photonic recoil, the atom must already be cold. So if p is huge, uh, if p is, let's say, 10,000 uh, 10, 10, 10, uh, recoil, then one recoil more or less, you will not, not be able to measure it. But if it's, um, if it's cold, if, if, uh, if the initial uh, momentum is already colder than, than a single photon recoil, as in the case of both Einstein concepts, for example, then uh, making, uh, uh, transferring a single photon recoil to one atom of the condensate, for example, will expel the atom from the condensate, and you can de de detect it separately from the, from the condensate. Okay? So uh, you need cold atoms in order to, uh, for, for this term to be detectable or interesting. 
Okay, and this is basically what a big part of the school were all, uh, all about, no? uh, investigating uh, uh, this, this, this term. Okay, now why uh, uh, is atom optics interesting? Um, I prepared here a small, a small uh, a picture. I think one of the reasons is um, because uh, uh, atomic clouds, so if you don't have only one atom but, but many atoms, they're at the same time microscopic and microscopic. They're microscopic because uh, uh, they are, the, the clouds are very dilute. So uh, typical densities are 10 to the 12 atoms per cubic centimeters, which is 10 orders of, of magnitude below the density of the air that we breathe. So these experiments are made with very dilute samples. So you can imagine as a, the trajectory of a photon just uh, uh, bouncing of uh, in individual atoms by Rayleigh scattering, for example, uh, which are located in, in the cloud. So we, you say here, you see here, now there's a trajectory of, of uh, one photon entering the cloud, is hitting one atom, is absorbed by one atom, is uh, re-emitted into another direction, and if the cloud is optically dense, then, then there, there can be a lot of, uh, of um, of absorption, re-emission processes before the, the, the photon finds its way out. But at the same time, uh, the cloud is pretty dense, okay? Uh, so uh, uh, you can actually um, attribute uh, a, a refraction index to the whole cloud as a, as a bulk. So you can, uh, you can consider this as a, as a macroscopic entity. So you can, um, you can for example, uh, uh, this is, um, yeah, this is, problem actually uh, lensing effects from dense clouds. Uh, if you want to image the, the cloud, you, you, uh, you shine in a laser beam and it's, uh, it's diffracted or refracted like, uh, like, like, a, like a prism. Okay, so li the light is diffracted from a dense atomic cloud uh, like a prism. Uh, you can also order the atomic cloud in optical lattices and then you can have other uh, collective effects like uh, optical lattices also, uh, uh, like, like photonic bands. Where, the, uh, where you have bracket scattering uh, in, 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 uh, in various uh, directions here. But um, what is interesting is that, um, uh, that the, the fact that, that your sample is at the same time microscopic and microscopic allows you to study the, the transition from the quantum world to the microscopic world. And this is, um, this is very interesting because um, uh, there's a lot, of, uh, lot of which is unknown. I mean, we know uh, how microscopically light is interacting with, with, uh, with micro microscopic objects. For example, a prism. We know how light is reflected by prism. The Maxwell equation is telling us this. No? We know also how light is interacting with a single atom. This is Bohr's model, who tells us that, an, that a photon is absorbed and then it's, uh, it's uh, isotropically, isotropically uh, emitted in, in all directions. But we don't, we don't know very much about uh, the mes mesoscopic features. So what are the co cooperative effects what happens if, um, if, the, if, the atom, if the photon is not scattered uh, only by, by a single atom, but by several atoms? Or by, yeah, whether they are disordered or whether they are, they are ordered. So there are a whole new of cooperative, cooperative effect that we will uh, learn also a lot during the, the school. And uh, Eric Ackermanns will, uh, will uh, enter this uh, area of cooperative scattering. Um, and I will also, in the last, last lecture, uh, go a little bit more in the, into this uh, area of, uh, of studies. Um, now, but for, the, for the time being, let us, let us stick to, uh, to a single atom and understand, at least tr try to understand how a single atom is interacting with, um, with light. Now, uh, yes, so nowadays we have a very uh, powerful control of... Um, of all the degrees of freedom because of the invention of very powerful techniques uh, uh, trapping the, uh, uh, controlling, controlling the, uh, the atomic cloud. So we can, we can capture atoms in, um, in, in potentials. We can cool them down to nano Kelvin temperatures. So we can, act, we can actually control the interaction of the atomic cloud with its environment. So we can, we can avoid particle exchange. We can uh, avoid en energy exchange. So we can, we can put the atoms in, in, uh, in, in ordered structures and simulating other fields of physics like solid state physics. We, uh, in, in, in uh, quantum optics, uh, in, in atom optics, we have seen many effects uh, that, we are, that are impossible to see with solid state physics, although these effects have been already uh, predicted for, for solid states, but they have never been seen because uh, solid state physics are, are dirty systems. And this, these systems, they are pure. 
we can assure that at, at each, each lattice site there's exactly, uh, exactly one atom, uh, only one and not two and not zero atoms under some circumstances. So uh, these uh, structures, they are perfect, okay? Uh, and, uh, and so um, some of the features that, that we have detected in, in, uh, in atom optics is block oscillations you know, and uh, mod insulating phases, all, all um, uh, uh, features or phenomena that are very difficult to see in other, uh, in other uh, fields. So nowadays, this is a very good theoretical and experimental playground to emulate other fields of physics, which are much more difficult, uh, difficult to, con to control. So, and um, yeah, if, if you uh, have already been in the lab, um, an atom optics uh, labs, then you, you know that uh, single, yeah, it's, a, it's still a tabletop experiment, although the experiments are very, very difficult, of course. No? I think in, in, in South America, there are only two or three groups, maybe maybe four or five, who deal with cold atoms. Uh, of course, it's very expensive, and it's not it's not easy to uh, to make this uh, run. No? So, um, but it's still a tabletop, tabletop experiment, which can in principle be controlled by a single or let's say two or or, or three <laughs> good students. <laughs> so you don't need an accelerator or something. Yeah? So there's already an advantage. Okay, so um, here I sketched them. Um, I'm making propaganda, uh, advertising for for this kind of field of physics. Uh, you can uh, you can make traps. For, for atoms, okay? So typically you have between one and 10 to the 10 atoms, sometimes ions. You can vary the, the, the density, so the density and also the optical density by compressing or decompressing the trap. So you can vary between 10 to the nine and 10 to the 14 per cubic centimeters. You can cool them uh, to micro Kelvin temperature and even there are even people who are able to cool, to cool it to pico Kelvin temperature, temperatures. And last not least, uh, uh, um, a very interesting uh, breakthrough is also the observation of Feschbach resonances. Feschbach resonances uh, allow you to control the interaction between between two atoms. Okay, so you can control the the, the, the interaction strength and the self-interaction energy of, uh, uh, of of a dense cloud. And now you have control over every uh, every uh, part of the kinetic uh, of the energy that uh, comes into play when doing uh, yeah, uh, atom optics. You can control the potential energy, you can control the kinetic en energy, and you can even control the kinetic energy over wide ranges. So you can actually zero the, the, the interaction energy and make a um, perfectly ideal gas, or you can make it huge and have a, a, uni a, a, a unitary, uh, going into the unitary regime, have a, uh, a global interaction of every atom with, with all other, uh, other, other atoms. Okay. So this makes this the strength of this field of physics, and um, I think it's it's w really worth um, yeah considering this for uh, for basic experiments. Now I have to uh, to go a little bit yeah prepare a little bit the uh, the background for for the uh, theoretical description. Okay, so uh, obviously we start with the Schrodinger equation, but we will see later on that this this is will not not be sufficient. So Schrodinger equation, I suppose that everybody of you is familiar with uh, the basic uh, uh, basics of quantum mechanics and electrodynamics, uh, and everybody has seen this the Schrodinger equation. Uh, normally, uh, what you do when when the system is complicated, you you do a perturbation theory. Okay, so uh, you separate your Hamiltonian into one stationary part and one part that you consider as a, perturb as a perturbation, which may, which may be time dependent. So this is time dependent perturbation theory. Okay, we assume that we already solved the, the stationary uh, Schrodinger equation. So we, you, uh, we assume that we already have a, a basis of eigenfunctions for the stationary part of the Hamiltonian. Okay, 
And actually, this, uh, this uh, uh, time-independent Schrödinger equation for the time-independent part is already the, re the result of a, of a separation ansatz um, uh, uh, starting from a time-dependent uh, time Schrödinger equation also for the, uh, the uh, non-perturbed part of the Hamiltonian. So the solution of the, of the, um, of the time-independent part of the Hamiltonian we also uh, result in time-dependent uh, wave equations, now, which are basically uh, the eigenvalues multiplied with the phase factors, which correspond to the energy of the of the corresponding eigenstate. Okay, so um, uh, every every eigen uh, um, yeah every eigenfunction of the um, of the non-perturbed Hamiltonian has a time evolution which uh, corresponds to this uh, phase factor. Of course, if you measure, uh, um, if you're interested in observables, uh, this phase factor is not interesting, but it may be interesting if you uh, try to do transitions between uh, different states. Okay. Now, what we do, um, yeah, now, now what we do uh, in uh, perturbation uh, uh, theory is uh, that we that we express the, the time dependent uh, function of the perturbed uh, Hamiltonian uh, in terms of the unperturbed eigenfunctions. Okay, so uh, let me. So you, normally you, you you do this for all the for all levels uh, that that your atom is uh, sub subject to. So uh, if your Hamiltonian is like like for example you, your your uh, time dependent Hamiltonian is a radiation field, then it may interact with all transitions which are over there. But uh, if the if the frequency does not match between two uh, between two between the difference between of two uh, energy levels, then uh, the the interaction might be very weak, and we can disconsider this. So in most most time, and uh, if you have laser uh, 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 lasers uh, uh, as radiation source, you can uh, very often address exactly two levels that you want uh, to to make uh, transitions. Okay, so let me uh, uh, come right away to uh, two level systems, which are. Uh, for the most part of this course, uh, sufficient. So uh, I write the wave equation uh, um, of, the, of the total Hamiltonian in terms of um, coefficients and um, the unperturbed wave functions. So the two levels are labeled one and two. Okay. And uh, now it's simple. We, we just insert this into the Schrodinger equation, and we, we derive from this equations of motion of these coefficients. Okay. So when we do this, <coughs> uh, then we get uh, so we get different uh, time uh, uh, um, different terms. Because um, if you take the time der der derivative of C, you have to uh, take the derivative of the coefficients, but also of the wave functions. Okay? But the time der der derivative uh, of the wave functions, uh, that will uh, uh, already be solved, because for this, we already have a, a working uh, Schrodinger equation in zero order. Okay, so uh, the terms which are, which are remaining are basically only the following terms. Okay. There are more terms, uh, uh, basically, where, uh, you know, where, where you have the time dependence of the, of the uh, unperturbed wave functions, but these drop out uh, in the zero order. So this is uh, the terms that remain in first order. 
Okay, now uh, we uh, we simplify these equations by multiplying uh, from the from the left uh, with one and also with two. Okay, then you can extract uh, th those those terms which go with one and those terms which which, which goes with a with a uh, cat two, and you get two equations. Yeah, and uh, also introducing the abbreviation. Now that's the energy distance uh, uh, of the two levels. Uh, I call this h bar omega zero. Then um, basically, uh, following equations. Now, this is um, actually this. Uh, this is there's no uh, no approximation made here. This is just the result of an expansion of my wave function uh, uh, in two in two levels. So, uh, or if you if you like, the only approximation I made is to assume that I can approximate my atom by a two-level system. Okay, so I, I only address two of the levels with a with a laser beam, and only those those uh, those two levels I extract from my atoms, and the other I just disregard. They can have an influence, but in, in many experiments they, they simply don't because they are they are very far uh, far detuned. Okay, but uh, so this is still uh, still exact, uh, and you have now equations of motion of uh, of the coefficients. Now, mostly um, what you have is um, you will uh, you will want to study uh, transitions between two levels, okay? And transitions means uh, uh, that uh, typically you, you you choose your your transitions such a way that they are in the in the interaction Hamiltonian or in the in the perturbation, let's say. So this H zero here, uh, you will choose as your atom, which is stationary, and all the transitions you will put into the into the perturbations. If you do so, uh, then, then this here will not have uh, di diagonal ele elements. All the diagonal elements, which are the, the eigenstates of the, of the, of the atomic uh, structure, they are in the, uh, in the atomic part. So if H1 has no diagonal uh, elements, then I can disregard these two parts. Okay? So uh, this, uh, this will not contribute. Yeah? Uh, and I, uh, I only have now uh, very simple, simplified equations, uh, which are basically, uh, let me write them down again. So, so uh, A, no, don't, don't forget, uh, A is, uh, is a uh, probability amplitude of the, uh, of the atom to be in, in the eigenstate one. For example, uh, let's consider an atom here. One, two, okay, and um, uh, the atom can be either here or here. Yeah, you can uh, now irradiate a laser beam and and try to make a transition. Yeah. So uh, the, um, the this this energy and this energies th there will be the eigenstates of the atom. So there will be the diagonal parts um, which are in this uh, Hamiltonian, and uh, those terms which. Uh, which allow you to mix the, the, the two levels to make transitions, I put in the uh, interaction matrix H1 okay, so that I can disregard uh, these two terms. And, uh, and the probability of finding the atom in the ground state is nothing else than I A1 squared. And here, A2, A2 squared, sorry, A2 squared is the probability of finding the atom in the, in the upper level. Okay? So this is a probability density or pr probability amplitude. Okay, now I can write this um, like that. Uh, 
<coughs> to make it uh, a short notation, when H uh, two, and so there are two coupled differential equation. which actually look similar. They, they, are, they, are very, they look very symmetric. It's like changing uh, the, the index one and two and uh, being careful about, uh, about this order of the, of the matrix element. And there is a minus changing here. But otherwise, they are exactly the same. And why is that? Well, there is no reason uh, why I should have drawn the, the two-level system like this. like this. I could have also drawn it like this. And um, basically, there is physically no difference between between uh, between writing it like this and like this. So I can exchange the the, ro the role of the uh, uh, of, of the uh, probability amplitudes. Actually, uh, we will see later on that there will be a, uh, a difference, but this difference is only due to the fact that there might be spontaneous emission. Okay? If there's no spontaneous emission, the two levels are completely equi equivalent. It doesn't matter what energy is between the levels. But as long as there's no spontaneous uh, emission which breaks the symmetry of, uh, uh, of, the, of the two levels, uh, these, these equations must be, must be identical. Okay? Now, mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, here we are just looking to the linear dispersion of That's that. right. That's right. And, and this don't have like, we can do that. In a sense, it's not correlated with like the position and it, the. Yes. It is correlated. It, it is correlated. It will be correlated. Uh, we have to study this, uh, this later on. Uh, yeah, you're right to, uh, uh, to make this comment because uh, this, was not, this was not clear, maybe. We are, st we are now. Uh, 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 concentrating uh, on so uh, the zero here, actually it's nothing else than the electronic part. Okay, and the H one is the interaction part. The center of mass will come uh, will, will come later. Uh, very this is uh, very often this is a good uh, this is sufficient to do this when the atoms are hot, for example. So if you do atomic physics. If you are not interested in the in the motion of the atoms, very often it works. Um, uh, very often you can just disregard the atomic motion. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's not always the case. So if you have uh, ultra cold atoms, and uh, then what happens is, for example, uh, an atom uh, which uh, which is uh, absorbs, uh, absorbs a resonant photon, it will be accelerated. Once it's accelerated, it has a velocity. And the velocity makes that the subsequent photon see a moving atom, uh, which is now moving away. That means that the, that the transition of the atoms is Doppler shifted with respect to the, in, in, to the, to the next coming photons. Okay? That means uh, that uh, if you are so sensitive with your, with your lasers that, uh, that you are sensitive to the single photon Doppler shift, which uh, there are many experiments who, who are sensitive to that, um, then uh, you cannot uh, restrict to this uh, to this here. Then you have to consider uh, simultaneously also the center of mass motion. But uh, let me first uh, talk uh, about the center of, uh, of uh, about the electronic structure, and then include the, the center of mass motion uh, later on. There's also another point. Uh, uh, very often, the dynamics of the of the electron is much faster. Uh, so it can be uh, adiabatically eliminated from the from from the uh, external motion. So uh, whether the atoms is, mo is moving slowly or not, it will always follow uh, uh, the internal the internal dynamics. But this is also not always true. Depends on the experiment. But in many many experiments, uh, you can separate the internal dynamics and the and the external dynamics. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So uh, this is only, uh, let's say, for example, uh, I only consider one mode, no, no, no vacuum fluctuation, no, no, no spontaneous emission, one mode, so I don't need the label K. So for example, photon annihilation and uh, creation of, uh, of an excitation. So this is, this is what I'm studying right now. Plus uh, the, 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 
the uh, com complex conjugate, no? Uh, let's see. Which is also uh, possible in our ways, no? Okay. So um, now uh, let me be a little bit more specific about about the laser. Uh, so I write now explicitly the uh, perturbation. Uh, I mean, this we learn in in um, in electrodynamics that uh, the energy of the, inter the interaction energy of a radiation field and uh, a dipole can write like this. It's, it's a dipole, the dipole approximation. So we, we always stay in the dipole approximation right now. No? Uh, it's uh, the electric field times the, the atomic dipole moment. And uh, the electric field is, of course, a cosine or a sine. You can write it like. A, by a polarization vector, then you have a cosine. Let's consider propagation along the z-axis, for example, times r. So e times e times r is a dipole moment, no? and uh, the rest here, this is an electromagnetic field. Okay, and then uh, in this case, you can write down the the matrix elements. Um, they are then given by uh, the amplitude of the field times kz times omega t times the dipole matrix element for the transition. So this um, this is dipole operator. Uh, so, so these are the things that, that you calculate in, for example, for um, hydrogen atom. You, know? um, you can calculate this explicitly. If you put here your 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 uh, orbitals, no? your your uh, your wave function for the initial state, for the final for the final state, and you couple them by by, by matrix element R, no? then you can can calculate this, this transition amplitude. Okay, uh, but uh, since we are not interested in the in the atomic details, so we we just uh, write down here an abbreviation, which uh, put everything that that we are not interested in right now into a single. Uh, um, yeah, symbol, uh, which is called capital, uh, which is capital omega, and which we will call the Rabi frequency. Okay. So this is the Rabi frequency, <coughs> and we will see what what the purpose of this Rabi frequency will be. So typically, we also let uh, the z uh, be be zero. We can, we, since we have only one atom, we can also put it in the in the origin. No? So we can just uh, let Z be zero, and now um, we have to um, to do an approximation in order to be able to solve the system analytically. So you can write down the cosine now, which is only cosine of minus omega t, as uh, a superposition of two exponentials. Okay, and now with this here we go back. Uh, we insert now this transition element into our equations here. Okay, and then you will see um, that um, uh, if you if you put this, uh, let's say you, you, you take the first exponential here, and you put this into into this equation, yeah, then you will see that we have ter terms here which are proportional to e to the <coughs> minus e omega zero minus omega t. Yeah. If you take the, the the plus, if you take the minus, you will have a plus. Okay. Now uh, I, said, I said that uh, uh, typically, if we wanted to do a transition and uh, be able to treat this as a two-level system, we choose uh, normally the the frequency the frequency here. So let's call the, the the distance of the level omega zero and the frequency of the incident light omega. Uh, the the transition will also will only be very um, very efficient if the frequency is close to the transition frequency, omega close to omega zero. Now, uh, if, you, uh, if you have omega zero minus omega here, you will see that, that you will have terms that are slowly oscillating, and you, have, you will have terms that are very fast oscillating, because omega zero is on the same order as omega, and you, if, uh, if you add them up, uh, then, then you have twice the oscillation frequency. So these, uh, these terms, uh, the fast oscillating terms, they are usually neglected in a in the approximation, which is called the rotating wave approximation.
Okay, so uh, all the terms which are uh, which are oscillating with double with, with double frequencies are neglected. They are oscillating so fast that they average out. Okay, uh, this uh, uh, rotating uh, wave approximation is very good in most cases, but not always. Mm -hmm. So it depends uh, if your laser is very strong, if your Rabi frequency is very strong, and there are situations where, uh, where this uh, rotating wave approximation does not hold. OK, now we have an, uh, a, system, an, a system of two couple di differential equations, which, which we can, of course, try to solve by standard proce procedures. I mean, this is not a difficult math mathematical problem. So we should be able to do that. Well, in the basic uh, the basic procedure to solve such a, a differential uh, equation is the following. First, let me let me introduce um, an abbreviation, which is called delta. Uh, and delta is defined as the difference between the incident laser light and the and the uh, the resonance frequency. So omega minus omega zero is called detuning. Okay. Now uh, with this um, with this uh, definition. And also with, with the definition of the Rabi frequency, I can now re rewrite uh, the equations of motions here. So uh, replacing this transition uh, matrix element divided by H bar uh, by the Rabi frequency, and also um, uh, the, the cosine, there's a cosine here, which is entering uh, the equation uh, via this matrix element. Uh, I divide in the in the exponentials, and I only take those exponentials which are close to the to the uh, uh, transition frequencies. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I get this here, and a two minus. To the minus e delta t. Okay. So, um, so I, I allow for the for the possibility uh, that the that the Rabi frequency is complex now because uh, if I uh, take the complex conjugate of this here, so you know, this is not, nothing else than the complex conjugate of this, of course. No? So I, if I call this the, the Rabi frequency, then this, this this is a complex conjugate of the Rabi frequency. Uh, yes, so these are the two equations that I need to solve. Uh, and uh, in mathematics, we do this by making an ansatz. No? And the ansatz is typically uh, an exponential. So one ansatz that is already motivated by the fact that, that we know what the result is. No? But uh, you will see that this leads very quickly to a Solution. So this is the ansatz that we can make. Yeah. If I do, if I put this ansatz now in these two equations, you can do every ansatz. No? Uh, I mean, the, uh, you will always get the, the, the right, uh, the right uh, result, of course. Uh, only uh, that you have to make uh, more or less difficult calculations. If you do the ansatz like this, the calculations are, are easier. Okay. And then inserting uh, uh, this in these equations, I will not uh, do the. Uh, do the algebra explicitly. It's anyway, it's all in the script. Um, I can uh, see that uh, I get the following conditions. Uh, so with this under, uh, necessarily the, um, the G here that I introduced as uh, in the exponent uh, must satisfy this condition. Okay, so uh, now the, the omega here, the delta here. So by inserting this here, you know, I get uh, two equations, and both equations uh, lead to the same conditions, which is this this uh, this condition here. 
Uh, and the, the coefficients i, a, and b, they are, of course, defined by the initial conditions of, uh, that, that I want uh, to set uh, to my system. So whether uh, the system is initially in the ground state or is it initially in the excited state. And the typical in, uh, initial condition would be um, choosing a, 1, 0, 1. So it means that at time, at time 0, the probability to find the atom in the ground state is 1, and to find it in the excited state, obviously, is then 0. Okay. And the probability amplitude to find uh, the atom in the excited state is then 0. So if I put, so these are conditions. Né? So this, uh, this is a really uh, uh, a result of this ansatz. And here, this is an arbitrary condition that I set to the system. Uh, which allows uh, me to to uh, to define A and B. So if this uh, under these initial conditions, it's easy to see that um, that uh, A must be minus B yeah, because um, if T is equal to zero uh, here, yeah, if T is equal to zero, then obviously uh, uh, A one <laughs> Uh, let's see, A1, it's, uh, yeah. No. This is it. So we, uh, this one that we do for two. Yeah. OK, then. So um, it, it, it actually doesn't matter because uh, since we, have to, we don't have spontaneous emission, uh, the labeling one or two makes, uh, makes no difference at all. But in order to, to stay consistent uh, later on with the lecture, uh, I make answers for the, uh, for the level two. And then uh, at time zero, of course, I have the conditions that A and B must, the sum of A and B must be zero. Okay, then I can from, uh, with, under this additional uh, initial constants, uh, conditions, I can solve my uh, equations of motions, and I get G2 time. OK. Now, <coughs> uh, now of course, uh, uh, I, I substitute B here uh, with, with minus A, and then I can write it down like this. Now, uh, A1. Uh, I can calculate because A1 is nothing else than the integral of A1, uh, of A2. So I have to try to calculate the integral of this equation in order to calculate A1. And uh, if I do this, so write, let me write it quickly here. So this is um, the integral of A2. Uh, A1 is integral of A2 times minus E omega sub so 2 uh, A E delta T E T linear. And the result will be minus 2 A omega delta T sub so 2 G cosine G sub 2 T minus E delta sinus G T. Okay. <clears throat> now I have, uh, I have the two analytic solutions of, uh, of, uh, of my problem, of my two-level problem. Okay, and um, now... <clears throat> You can uh, determine uh, the coefficient a from simply from the fact that you need that uh, a1 squared plus a2 squared is equal one because it's a probability. The atom must be somewhere, must be down, must be in the ground state or in the excited, excited state. So from this, from this here, you can uh, you can determine uh, a and uh, solve the the, the problem uh, completely. Let me show you.
it's not appearing. Right here. So uh, actually here you, you see the you see a part of the calculations and you see the final result. <coughs> yeah. And if I plot this, uh, this is a graph. So actually here you can click on this and uh, for the MATLAB code if you're interested. Uh, now the blue line here uh, is for delta equals zero. So if I choose uh, the detuning, zero, that means that omega is exactly omega zero. So this is what we call resonance, the resonance condition. Then uh, I get an oscillation here, uh, which, is, uh, which is periodic in two pi. Okay. So actually what I can do, for example, I can uh, ir irradiate, irradiate a laser beam uh, for a period corresponding to t over omega, yeah, t, t over omega. What I do then is I put all the population in the, in the uh, excited state. So um, if you do uh, a radiation pulse here, which is not uh, continuous, but which is only a pulse, and if this time here is equal to pi over uh, over omega, no? then after after this time, the atom will be in the upper state. It will go from from the ground state to the upper state. So this is what we call pi pulse. Okay, so uh, you can actually make an inversion. You know, this is um, maybe surprising uh, um, that that you can uh, invert the energy of a system. Which just, this is uh, in violence to the um, to the thermodynamic equilibrium. No? So it's, it's in violence to the Boltzmann law, which says that, that the lowest energy states has, must always have a higher population than the higher energy, energy state. Okay, but of course it's not a it's not a system which is in thermal equilibrium. It's just um, we, we don't have spontaneous emission yet included, okay? But uh, if, uh, and, and there, are, there are many st uh, systems which are metastable, they are used in quantum information uh, a lot, of course. No? If you have a, a stable to, to level system which, where the upper state is sufficiently, sufficiently stable, you can make an inversion. You can put the atoms uh, in, the upper, uh, in the upper state, which corresponds to negative temperature, if you like. No? Uh, now the problem is, um, uh, this only works if you have uh, your laser put exactly in resonance. No? If, your, if your laser is not in resonance, so if there is some detuning, you have the green curve here. And this is a, the green curve is calculated for detuning corresponding to a gamma, where gamma is uh, the natural language, which we learn about later. Uh, and the red is even, even larger detuned. So which is interesting, you, uh, by increasing the, the detuning, you increase the Rabi frequency because the, the, the frequency is higher. But the probability to go to the, to the excited state is lower. You can never go to, uh, to a fully inverted state uh, with, a, with a detuned uh, laser. You have to put your laser exactly on resonance. Now, this is difficult uh, technologically because uh, your, your, your level system here is only stable. Your upper state is only stable when it's metastable. I mean, if it's if a national line width is very, it's very narrow. Otherwise, uh, this, the state would, would, would decay very quickly to the, to the ground state. This is not what you want in quantum information, for example. Now, uh, if, um, uh, but if your uh, upper level is metastable, that means that the line width is very narrow. And that means that your, that your uh, frequency, so your, the radiation frequency that you use to do, to do the inversion must be very, very precisely defined. Okay, so... Um, for example, in strontium, we have this, uh, this, uh, inter this intercombination line. Uh, there is one, one line which is six kilohertz uh, wide, which uh, is in the, in the red uh, spectral regime. Uh, and in order to, to be able to put the laser on resonance, we need to provide um, a frequency which is uh, six, eight, nine. And then um, what, what's coming then? Well, there are uh, an all in all 10 digits or nine digits. So let's go one, two, three, four, five, six. I think at least so many digits. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a lot of digits, and your laser must be so stable uh, that, that it's not fluctuating here. And this is technologically difficult, I can tell you. <laughs> but uh, there are people who, who can do that even more. No? There are people in the United States and Europe which can go to the, here, yeah, I don't know, 10 to the 15th no, or something. <laughs> Yeah, there was a question. Can you just explain a little better what the omega, the 
This one here? Yeah. It's an abbreviation for the, uh, for the transition uh, matrix element. So why did I put this here? Here, no? The other omegas, they are very similar, like the frequency of the yes. photon or the Exactly. This is the oscillation frequency. This is a, this is um, uh, to have a picture of this. The square of the of this is uh, proportional to the light intensity. So if you put more light, yeah, then then you can do uh, faster Rabi oscillations. You need less time to make an inversion. Okay. Uh, formally, it's just uh, this here is just uh, the abbreviation of this and this. Okay. So. Sorry? <coughs> this one here? Yes, this is a, this is a transition uh, operator here. So, um, uh, for example, um, so uh, th uh, this here is a scalar, and this is an operator. Okay? So uh, you would, um, I mean, uh, basically, this is, a, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with, with quantum mechanics. This is uh, this, this um, harmonic, spherical harmonics for a dipole operator. So you can have it for quadrupole, octopole, or something. And uh, I don't rem remember exactly the shape for the for the uh, dipole matrix op operator. So it's a spherical harmonics, which depends on on, on this here. And uh, so if you have your your hydrogen wave function, you may have, uh, for example, a transition between states uh, C000 of your hydrogen of your hydrogen electron. And then you have, uh, let's say, Z, yeah. and then state uh, C1000, and then, then you take the, the integral, and this is your matrix. This is your uh, your matrix element. This is this is this here. So two is just an abbreviation of this of this uh, orbital, and one would be an abbreviation of the other orbital. And uh, the Z here is just uh, is just your your uh, your R here. You could also write Z when when I project it on the Z axis. Okay. So here you have orbitals like um, I don't know. For example, would be something like I don't have it in my head now. Like the orbitals for the the, the main orbitals uh, of your hydrogen atom. Yeah? So you also have an R here. And if you calculate the the uh, the uh, your integral, uh, then you have to, yeah, it's complicated mathematically, but um, basically it's nothing else than this. Yeah, mathematically, uh, it's just uh, to to simplify, uh, yeah, to simplify um, the, um, yeah, to, to get rid of the fast rotating terms, which which would make it un impossible to solve the equation easily. There's another uh, interpretation that is um, that is often uh, that is very closely re related to this, and uh, you can also read this in the script. Um, the rotation rotating wave approximations. Um, uh, Basically, if you have your uh, your operator of your atom and your and your uh, on the light field, then you have to to, um, to um, multiply them. For example, uh, here uh, I have uh, uh, for for the for the um, for the light field, I have a combination of photon creation and annihilation operator, and they act interact. With um, uh, um, excitation creation and excitation annihilation operator. So in, in fact, that my interaction Hamiltonian, I should write it more correctly, uh, like like this. Okay, the atomic part times the uh, the, the atomic part times the, the the photonic part. Now, if I uh, if I um, uh, multiply all those terms, I have four terms. Okay, I have um, uh, this one. Plus this one, plus uh, this one, plus uh, A, K, uh, annihilation, and this one. Okay. 
Now you see, uh, this, uh, this makes sense. Uh, this is what, no, let me see. Here, yeah, minus, and here, and here, plus. Okay. Now, does this make sense? Uh, no, sorry. This, this makes sense because um, a photon creation corresponds to uh, de-excitation. This also makes sense because um, a photon annihilation corresponds to a photon um, to um, excitation. These do not make sense because uh, they correspond to photon uh, annihilation together with a de-excitation. So it, it, uh, it violates energy conservation, these, these two terms. And these two terms, they correspond exactly to those terms that I would have uh, here by, by considering terms uh, no, where the where the uh, frequencies are added. Now uh, this this, on, this is only an approximation because this, uh, these um, two terms do not make sense in a single photon process, but they may make sense in the in the second in the, in the two, uh, higher order process. So for example, uh, I can consider uh, um, I don't know a photon a photon creation. So uh, while the atom is going to a higher state, if and quickly after that, uh, this, the whole system is going back by absorbing a photon. Okay, and uh, the the order of the of the process is not defined by the uh, by the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is just um, it's just the energy. It doesn't tell, tell you whether the, the process has, has to be a single photon process or, or, the, or two photon process. Okay, so in higher order, uh, uh, these these terms uh, do make sense. And and uh, if the Rabi frequency is high. So that uh, that these uh, two higher order processes are likely, then you have to consider uh, uh, also the counter rotating terms, also also this 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 terms here, and um, and these uh, even lead to uh, to observable uh, observable physical effects, which are called the block Seagate shift, for example, so light, uh, energy shift of the of the levels due to uh, due to the fact that rotating wave approximation may not may not apply. So this is the physical origin of this. So uh, this, this derivation is semi-classical. So the, the whole uh, uh, quantum um, derivation, which photon annihilation and, and, uh, and creation uh, dropped a little bit out of this, of this treatment. But this is what's really what is uh, behind that. So the Rabi frequency is basically the, the frequency of the oscillations. You have, you have an atom, you, you shine a laser, uh, laser beam in, and then you will... You will uh, uh, and periodically, you, find, you will find uh, the atoms in the lower state, then in the upper state, in the lower state, in the upper state, okay? Depending on, on, these, on these oscillations here. Okay. Now, I think I have to speed up a little bit. Okay, so um, I think sometimes it's easier to visualize uh, your uh, equations in a matrix shape. So you can write actually your <coughs> your uh, system of equations in the following following shape. Um, Actually, this is useful because this is also the way that you that you will program it when you write, write MATLAB codes or so. And this is your Hamiltonian. Okay, so your Hamiltonian has non-diagonal elements. This is what I said. Right? So you have only a transition matrix elements, but you don't have uh, diagonal elements. Uh, uh, these have have been taken out in the first order. Okay. Now, what you can you can do you can simplify your uh, your equations by uh, making a, a following substitution. This doesn't change the physics, of course, but it uh, uh, simplifies the equation. Um, so, just simply by by multiplying uh, the amplitude of the upper state with a, with a phase factor, which depends on the detuning, this will transform your equation into
into this. Yeah? So this is another Hamiltonian. Okay. Um, yes. Of course, this corresponds to unitary transformations, so the physics doesn't change. Yeah? Only the, the representation of the physics does change. But now uh, the Hamiltonian is not time dependent anymore. No, here it's time dependent. Here it's not time dependent anymore. So the, the, the time dependence has been, trans, be, has been transferred into the into the amplitude. Okay, but the advantage now is that you can diagonalize this uh, this uh, this, um, this uh, Hamiltonian easy, and the the, uh, the result uh, of this diagonalization gives you the eigenvalues. Which are this one. So you have two eigenvalues, and um, which are separated by the by g. So I, I forgot to to say g is also called the generalized Darby frequency. No? Generalized Darby frequency. And um, so if you have actually two states, one and two. Irradiating a laser beam will shift these states to some other states, yeah? um, and this this is called the light shift or dynamic stark shift. So the fact that there is that there is some some uh, some uh, uh, degree of freedom coupling the, the two states leads to a, to an energy sh shift of the two states. And actually, if your um, if your uh, detuning, your laser detuning is very large, so if delta is much larger than, let's say, the Rabi frequency, then you can uh, uh, expand this because this is a, this is a, a root. No? So you have your G. Remember that this is the Rabi frequency plus the detuning. So you can uh, the Kenyan then. Uh, Expand this in a Taylor series about omega, and then uh, your approximate light shift your approximate light shift is then um, Uh, plus minus omega squared over four data. Okay, and uh, this formula is very often used because sometimes or very often we have laser beams which are far detuned and which are uh, uh, used to make um, uh, optical dipole traps. And the optical dipole traps uh, they are just um, based on this on this principle because imagine that your laser frequency is not is not homogeneous. You, 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 you have a you have an atom let's say which is here, and the laser beam. Which is big like this, which has maybe a Gaussian profile, so you have lots of intensity in the middle and, and less in the center. Okay, then uh, of course here outside where there's no laser beam, you will have two two levels here, here also. But if if uh, if as a laser beam comes stronger, you know, remember uh, that that this here is proportional to the light intensity because omega squared is, is proportional to the light intensity. So that means that uh, that your light shift will pre be proportional to the to the uh, intensity, and then it would will, will look almost like this here. Okay. Now, if your atom is in the ground state, you know, it will uh, just experience this as a potential. And so this is a potential for the external degrees of freedom now, uh, which we, which we will see later, which is able to trap atoms. And this is the way uh, atoms are trapped in single uh, in, in single laser beams in, or in superpositions of laser beams, so a standing wave, you know, which can be in various ge uh, geometries. So this here, if you, uh, but this uh, <clears throat> this is very very shallow. So of course uh, your your laser beam cannot be cannot be cannot make very strong forces. So you, your atoms need already be cooled in order to be trapped. Otherwise your atom come here. It's accelerated, it goes into the potential, it goes out on the other side. So it's a conservative potential. So the atoms must already be cooled. They must be cooled within the optical double trap to stay there. Okay. And uh, this is actually the, the idea of the optical tweezer. And it's like, I think the last Nobel Prize has been uh, awarded to um, Ashkin. 
and, um, and he's the inventor of, of the optical tweezer. You didn't understand this one? Um, so, yeah, I'm not very good in drawing, but this all will we, we, we come uh, back later. Ah, okay. So, <clears throat> you have a laser beam here? No? And uh, typically the laser beam, uh, uh, it's, it's a small laser beam, no? uh, so uh, one millimeter to two millimeters typically. And so, uh, you have a, an intensity profile so this is a radio intensity profile, and here is intensity. Uh, and typically, this is a Gaussian. So you have a lot of intensity in the center of the laser beam, but if you go to the to the edges of the laser beam, uh, the intensity will drop. Yeah, so it's a Gaussian profile. Um, now, uh, since uh, the energy of the internal states depends on the Rabi frequency, and the Rabi frequency squared is proportional to the intensity, uh, the the um, internal state energy depends uh, on the on position also because the intensity depends on position. So let's say uh, like this: um, the energy uh, shift, the light shift, depends on omega squared. Omega squared depends on i. I depends on r. And that means that uh, that this level shift here, you now uh, they they look they don't look abrupt like this, but they they look Exactly, no. <laughs> exactly like the shape of the Gaussian. So this one is uh, shifted up, the other one is shifted down. No? So there's plus minus, but this this depends on the on the detuning here. For for red detuning it's like this. For blue detuning it will be the other way around. But we will we will come back to that to the details later. But basically uh, this is uh, the internal potential, the internal potential uh, seen by the atoms uh, looks like that. And uh, as we will see also later, uh, the internal the internal potential is um, how to say it's um, mixed or is um, entangled. entangled. Yes, it's entangled with the <laughs> it's entangled with the outer uh, with the outer degree of freedom, uh, and then the outer degrees of freedom. So the the the, the kinetic energy. That I wrote, wrote on the initial formula here. This comes into play now, and this is what you what you what, what you trap. So this is an example where uh, the internal degrees of freedoms are entangled with the outer degrees of freedoms, and you can manipulate the the motion of the atoms uh, by by yeah by shining by by coupling two internal states. No? Yeah, it's. It's coupling. It's not a. It's not a like a two-particle entanglement. No? Yes. 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 Imaginary energy means uh, typically, um, uh, if it's real, it's it's a shift. If it's imaginary, it's a broadening of the line. Yes, uh, but since we don't have uh, um, we don't have spontaneous emission yet, uh, uh, I think uh, this, this is better to postpone this uh, once to this, this discussion to once we have spontaneous emission. Actually, spontaneous emission is not easy to to, to include here because um, but because your Hamiltonian needs to be Hamiltonian no? and um, uh, um, spontaneous emission. Uh, does not correspond to a coherent process, so it's not possible to include it directly into the. Oh, sorry, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm talking bullshit. This is uh, this is real here. Sorry, so it's not it's not, um, is this not there's no spontaneous emission. This is why it should not be uh, imaginary. So, <laughs> okay, but uh, anyway, uh, what you can do is you can you can artificially uh, include spontaneous emission here, anyway. No? So we put here, for example, uh, I don't know, um, a decay rate. Okay, and then uh, and then this will lead to imaginary parts in your in your light shift. There's actually a, a, an exercise where you can where you can calculate this. Um, so um, 
you can you can calculate uh, then also the, the broadening effect uh, due to yeah due, due to spontaneous emission here, and the broadening will uh, will appear here as an imaginary part. But uh, you have to take this with caution because um, this, ham this Hamiltonian, of course, is not uh, Hamiltonian, so you cannot uh, treat it like a normal normal observable. Yeah? But there are ways uh, to to treat this uh, anyway. Actually, I wanted to talk about this in the last part of the picture, but I'm not sure whether I come to this. So, um, yes, I think I should first go on with the dressed state notion. So okay, um, now uh, if I come back to the to the Hamiltonian that I've written <coughs> down initially, um, then uh, there was one Hamiltonian which actually. How much time do you need? Yeah, you told me I, it would be more than five minutes, I think. So. Uh, yeah, maybe that is too. Uh, yes, I, I agree. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Then uh, let's continue this afternoon. So then, um, it would take half an hour for the copy Okay. Mm -hmm. No, no, you're right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> because it's one and a half hour, it's a long, it's a long seat for also good students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had my, uh, in my head until 15 minutes more, but uh, but this is more than five minutes, so uh, uh, yes, yes, but 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 I only spent seven minutes. Ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so doesn't matter. But, no, no, so, okay. but, so it doesn't spend on me. No, I can do that. You have time anyway. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> 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 Actually, I Pode, pode ficar, fazer um fato desse. É, aquela figura que você desenhou do mesmo ali, o, o sinal da concavidade está certo, porque pelo que eu entendi, o nível 1 de energia ele é somado com aquele, com aquele valor ali. E o, e o 2 ele é subtraído. 